Well, we're continuing our series looking at Jesus and those who were blessed by his uh, presence in real life in the book and in the Bible. And um, tonight we're looking at Nicodemus. Nicodemus who was watching Jesus from a distance. I'll be reading from this little book here. <clears throat> the Word Became Verse, chapters 3, verses 1 to 21. Nicodemus was a man, a leader of the Jews, who was renowned throughout the land and honored for his views. A member of the Sanhedrin, well recognized by all, a teacher come by night to see the Lord outside the wall. He came by night so he could hide from prying eyes in town. Good rabbi, you must be from God. Your miracles abound. I'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind, about the things of heaven. I'm guessing you could shed some light, for you've been wisdom given. More rapidly than one might think, the master made reply, You do not understand as yet. You look through darkened eye. I tell you this, and it is true, unless you're born again, you'll never see the things of God, but just the things of men. What do you mean, this leader said? How can a man return into his mother's womb? It seems impossible to learn. Impossible with man, said Christ, for pauper or for king. It must be supernatural. It is a spirit thing. It takes a spirit to bring forth the supernatural life. It never will result from just a husband and a wife. The wind blows as it wills, and you can never tell from where, but you can see the leaves astir like on that tree right there. It's like that with the spirit, which you can't control at all. He moves where he determines to, and not by beck and call. But when he stirs inside your heart, his presence you can tell. It changes all you say and do, and what you think as well. How can these things be possible, Lord? Nicodemus asked. I want this change you talk about. I'm burdened with that task. If truth were known, I've felt the need, though teacher I may be, for something more than surface life I really want to see. All right, said Christ. I know your heart and that you are sincere. There is one thing that you can do to bring the Spirit near. As Moses lifted the bronze snake amid the desert sands, the Son of God must be raised up and gazed upon by man. I promise if you look my way and breathe a heartfelt prayer, it matters not how strong your faith, my spirit will be there. Your heart will stir, your soul rejoice, and you will know, my friend, the Holy Spirit's done his work and you've been born again. For this is why my Father sent his well-beloved Son, that everyone who trusts in him, no matter what they've done, need never perish, but can live in bliss forevermore. The serpent in the desert actually represents the door. Let's have one more prayer. Jesus, come tonight as we have a conversation with you. Would you please teach us the deep things of your word and let us be tuned in to understand we pray in your name. Amen. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. We can learn a few things about Nicodemus right off the top here. Number one, he was a Pharisee, which means he was a good liver. They were all about getting it right. Maybe a little bit like us. I've discovered we Adventists like to believe we're right. Isn't that right? The question I wonder is, are we dead right? Or are we alive right? Nicodemus was a good liver. People would look at him and say, he's trying to get it right. The Pharisees were going to get it right. Parents would look at their kids and say, you need to grow up to be like Nicodemus. He's a good man. He was a ruler of the Jews. That means he was part of the Sanhedrin. He was a senator. He was one of the top 70 leaders of the nation. I want to drop down to verse 10. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? I want you to notice the definite article is there, and it's there in the original language. He's not a teacher. He's not one of many teachers. He's evidently at the top of the teacher pecking order in the uh, whole educational and theological uh, landscape of Israel. Uh, 
So this guy is the PhD of PhDs. He's the scholar of scholars. He's at the top of his game. And I want to say one more thing. He is a fourth generation Jew. Now I use fourth generation because I'm a fourth generation Adventist. Lee is a fourth generation Adventist. Our grandpa discovered the Sabbath in the Bible. I thought he was the only one keeping it. And then he found that there was a whole church, so he joined up. We've been in it ever since. It's in our blood. I'm sure Nicodemus was a 40th generation Jew. It was in his blood. I have to tell you, if I actually discovered that there was another group of people that had better truth than us, it would be hard to make the switch. Because Adventism runs in my blood. And Judaism ran in his DNA. Now it says that this man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus comes by night. He's a man with a conflict of interest. He's strangely drawn to Jesus by his words and actions, but he's concerned what people might think if they see him showing an interest. After all, Jesus is an unsanctioned outsider. He doesn't have the right degree. He doesn't have the right credentials. He hasn't been sanctioned by the, the church, so to speak. He's an upstart from nowhere. But Nicodemus is somehow drawn. But remember, Nicodemus is a man with pride, position, and power, and a reputation to maintain and protect. He fears the scorn of his peers. Isn't it amazing that some of the most powerful people are the most fearful people? They'll only say what their handlers tell them to say. They got to make sure they, they, they uh, get both sides in all the time. I remember one of our late esteemed senators here from uh, Arizona once hiked the Grand Canyon. I remember reading a, an article. He went rim to rim. Took him three days. Now some of us do it in one day, but he made it in three days. Um, but I remember he's, he was asked about the canyon. And he said something that somehow he managed to mix the fact that God made this beautiful thing that evolved. You know, he had to get both sides in. Because he didn't dare take a stand. Some of the most powerful people are the most fearful people. Nicodemus is fearful. He comes at night. He sets it up like an interview to assess the situation. But he wants to be very careful that his influence doesn't have a risky direction on others. And he starts out by saying, we know. Teacher, rabbi, we know. Please notice, he doesn't say I know. He keeps a distance by going plural. Have you ever done that? I've had people come to me and to, to, to share a concern at the church. And they say, people are saying, right? Well, who are those people? I once had one dear saint who'd said that enough times that I finally said, you don't even have to follow Matthew 18. You don't have to send them one by one. Just get them all together and bring them and we'll have a talk. Or I don't want to hear about that again. And I never heard about it again. We know. He keeps an intellectual distance. But what is he saying? He's saying, Jesus, we have been watching you. He'd been watching Jesus. What might Nicodemus have seen by watching Jesus? Well, one thing we know, we know that the Pharisees, and Nicodemus was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, we know that the Pharisees sent a delegation down to the Jordan to talk to John the Baptist. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny. He confessed, I am not the Messiah. I find it interesting. They didn't ask if he was the Messiah. The messianic fever was so big, they didn't need to ask. They just said, who are you? And he said, well, I'm not the Messiah. That's the elephant in the room. They didn't say it, but they wanted to know. No, he says, I'm not the Messiah. Well, they said, are you Elijah? Because they believed Elijah was going to come before Messiah. He said, no, I'm not that. Are you the prophet? I believe that refers back to Moses. They believed Moses would show up. And he said, no. They said, well, then who are you? We have to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say for yourself? So this is an official delegation. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. 
And those who were sent were the Pharisees. When he quotes Isaiah there, that's a verse that they all understood meant he was the forerunner to introduce Messiah. I'm not Messiah, but I've come to introduce him. And they asked him, why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? And John answered saying, I baptize with water. But there is standing, it's present tense in the Greek. There is standing one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. John tells that delegation the Messiah is standing in the crowd. He's here, and I'm about to introduce him. Why do you baptize if you haven't been credentialed? Oh, there's a story I've got to tell. Remember 150 years ago, we built a little boat and sent it out to Pitcairn? We sent a missionary out there, and he preached to the people on the island. The whole island got converted and tried to join the church, but they couldn't because the man, the missionary they sent did not have the right credentials to baptize them. So we had to get on the boat and come all the way back and two years later send somebody with the right credential so that they could baptize all those poor people. Where in the world did we get that from the Bible? If you're good enough to preach it and they get saved, I think you're good enough to dunk them. But they're saying, John, why are you doing this? If you don't have the right credentials. John said, I baptize with water, but the one standing among you. So I want you to notice, I can't help but believe that either Nicodemus helped send the delegation, helped receive the report from the delegation, or maybe was there himself. And he must have heard about the voice and the dove that didn't fly away. What else might Nicodemus have seen? Well, Jesus disappears for six weeks. That's enough to get him off the front page of the newspaper, right? And then he appears again. John says, there's the Messiah. We talked about the disciples following this morning. And they headed up to Cana of Galilee, where Jesus very quietly turned about 150 gallons of water into 150 gallons of the best wine they'd ever had. And then he quietly slipped away. But the Bible says this beginning of signs... The word signs in the Gospel of John means the miracles Jesus did to give tangible evidence that he was more than just a man of words. He was a man of power. He was somebody special. He was the Son of God. And it says this sign Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. Just a little side trip here for a minute. The disciples saw that first miracle and they believed. And we discover that a momentum of believing was built up. As they saw more and more, they believed more and more. There's also a group that started seeing Jesus' signs, and they disbelieved. And you'll notice they built up a momentum of disbelief. They believed less and less until they came to the point where when Jesus raised a man who had been dead four days, he was, he was dead dead. He was rigor mortis dead. He was stinking dead. He was decomposing dead. They might have been able to claim Jairus' daughter swooned. They might have been able to claim that the widow of Nain's son swooned. But this guy was dead dead. And when Jesus raised him from the dead, even the Jewish leaders didn't believe the devil's power could do that. But what did they say? Those who were in a momentum of disbelief simply said he's getting so good we got to kill him and we got to kill Lazarus to get rid of the evidence. Be careful of the momentum you're building in your life. It can carry you to incredible places either direction. Anyway, back on track. I don't know if Nicodemus heard about the, the water to wine. I don't know if that news got from the backwaters of Galilee down to Jerusalem. But we do know that shortly thereafter, Jesus went down to the Passover. And while he was at the Passover, he did something Nicodemus couldn't miss. He noticed the emporium, that's the Greek word, the merchandising going on in the temple courtyard. And he made a little whip of cords 
and the man who had absolutely no official authority walked through that courtyard and all the men who had the official authority ran for the exits. And he shoot out the money changers and he shoot out the animals and he said to those who sold doves, take these away. Notice, he didn't overturn the dove cages. He would have hurt the doves. He said, take these away. There's no collateral damage when God moves through. And the men who were in power ran from the man who had no power, officially. And, of course, we know what the Pharisees and Sadducees did. They got around the corner and they said, why were we running? And they came back and said, who gave you the authority to do that? The thing is, he'd, they'd already voted with their feet that he had the authority. And he said, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of what? Merchandise. That's the Greek word emporium. There's one other place that that word gets used that's very interesting. In the time of Jesus, there was a translation of the Bible that we now call the Septuagint. It was the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek about 200 years before Christ. We know it was officially used at that time because virtually every New Testament quote from the Old Testament is word for word from the Septuagint. And guess what? A certain verse says, by the abundance of your trading, speaking of Lucifer, you were filled with violence within and you sinned. And I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. One of Lucifer's original sins, maybe pride was one, but another one was merchandising. Heaven is based on a giving economy, not a trading economy. Love gives whether anything's given back or not. Trading says, I'll give you this if you'll give me that. And Satan took the giving economy and turned right in the courts of heaven into a trading economy, and that was his original sin. So why are we surprised if he gets into the men of earth the people of earth, and they turn the very court of the house of God into an emporium. Jesus said, we're, this, is a, this is a gift shop, not an emporium. We don't merchandise here. And he drove them out. The very one who drove Lucifer out of heaven for merchandising drove the Jewish leaders out of the temple for merchandising. I find that an interesting parallel to consider and think about. And one other verse, John 2, 23. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Jesus evidently did many miracles during the time he was at Passover, and we don't have any of those stories. But I bet Nicodemus was watching. And in a way, I'm sure Nicodemus knew about the clearing of the temple because remember, it was the Sadducees who ran the temple. It was the Sadducees who cut a deal with Rome to get into power as the priesthood even though they weren't Levites. The Pharisees hated the Sadducees. The Sadducees hated the Pharisees. The Sadducees ran the temple. They set up the emporium, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if Nicodemus was standing on the sidelines saying, go for it, buddy. I don't know how you survive it, but go for it. Clear him out. So when we think about all of these items, and we come back to Nicodemus, and he says, teacher, we know you're a teacher come from God. Nobody can do the miracles, the signs that you do unless God is with him. He's got a whole history in his mind that he's thinking about. Now behind this, of course, is the elephant in the room. Nicodemus doesn't say, might you be the Messiah? But it's on his mind. We know that. No matter how you add up Daniel 9, the 70 weeks are over. There had been several false messiahs, we're told about in the book of Acts, who rose up and, of course, did what everybody thought Messiah was supposed to do. 
throw out the Romans, and all they did was get themselves killed. Nicodemus doesn't say, are you the Messiah? But he says, we know you must be a teacher come from God because we've been watching the things that you do. In a way, what Nicodemus is saying here to Jesus is, can we discuss spiritual matters? Nicodemus, as it were, comes to Jesus and says, let's talk about you. And what is Jesus' response? Before I read the verse, it's as if Jesus says, no, Nicodemus, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about you. And Jesus instantly turns this uh, intellectual interview into a pastoral visit. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, he looks him right in the eye and says these words that says, I'm serious about what I'm saying. Unless one is born again or higher born, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says, can we talk about spiritual matters? And Jesus says, not until you're born again. You wouldn't get it. You need to be higher born. You don't need theoretical knowledge. You need spiritual regeneration. You don't need new information. You need a new heart. I'm not interested in satisfying your intellectual curiosity. I want to lead you into real spiritual vitality. And this must have hit Nick's ego pretty hard. Probably irritating initially. But I think he swallowed it because there was something in here there was something about Jesus he wanted to know. I mean, Nicodemus, you need to be higher born. Who could be higher born than Nicodemus? He was a rich male Jew. That's as good as it gets. The Pharisees would pray, I'm thankful I wasn't born a woman. Sorry, ladies, but they would. And they believed that rich people were blessed and poor people were cursed, so they had an in with God. And he was a Jew, God's favorites. God didn't care about anybody else but Jews. That's what they believed. So this rich male Jew who knows the Torah, probably has it memorized, has Jesus look at him and say, you wouldn't get it. I hate it when somebody says to me, I'd love to explain that to you, but you wouldn't get it. Don't you hate that? What do you mean? You think I'm ignorant? Jesus looks at him and says, you wouldn't get it. It's, it's, you can talk all the religious stuff. You can have the Torah memorized. But if something hasn't happened in your heart, it's not going to be anything but just words. Kind of like teaching a parrot to say two plus two is four. The parrot still isn't doing math. It's just saying words. Has no idea the depth behind two plus two is four. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a story of Morris Venden, my personal spiritual hero. Um, he, as a young pastor, about 30 years old or so, up in Oregon, he'd preach his heart out on Sabbath morning, and this one little white-haired lady would meet him at the door. And I know it's true because he told the story on himself. She'd meet him at the door, and she'd shake his hand and look him in the eye and say, Pastor Venden, that was a fine sermon. It will be even better when you get to know Jesus for yourself. And Morris Venden said she was not a mean old lady. She was a sweet lady. And he said that the, the, the problem was it stung that, sh that it showed. Trying to talk about somebody you don't really know. Nicodemus, you know all the words, but you don't know. You don't really know. If I try to talk spiritual things to you, it would be like trying to explain to a person born blind the color red. How are you going to do that? Until the eyesight is restored, it will have no meaning at all. These verses, hearing they will hear and not understand, seeing they will see and not perceive. Until something happens inside, we just won't get it. Our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. We just don't get it because Satan has told us so many lies. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If you find reading the Bible about as exciting as reading the, uh, you know, the classified ads in the newspaper or maybe a, just reading a dictionary or something, it's not your fault. Without that spiritual click of being born again, being higher born, 
As Ellen White says, it's mere, mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. Anybody been there? I think we've all been there, or we're lying. Now, here's the amazing thing. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and said, sorry, we can't talk about deep spiritual things with you because until you get born again or higher born, you wouldn't get it. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, you can say that in one way, and I think it's kind of snarky, you know, a little bit sarcastic. But I don't think he did that or Jesus wouldn't have responded. I think he really was intrigued by this idea because no matter how much you have, when it's based on performance, you never feel that it's enough. And so he's looking for something. And so he says, how can an old man be born again? And Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you too, unless as one, one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I believe there Jesus is most likely talking about the water baptism of John. You should have gone down there and gotten baptized by John, repenting of your sins. And then, as John said, after me is coming one that will baptize you with the spirit. Nicodemus, you need to go through the same steps that all the ignorant people you think of as down there from you have been going through. They went down, they repented, they got baptized, and they're going to get the Spirit before you do. What's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the Spirit is spirit. It's a whole different world. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And by the way, you in that verse is plural. Nicodemus says, we, and Jesus says, you all. We've been watching you, and you all need to be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. You can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Now, I can just hear Nic Nicodemus is, is thinking in his mind, okay, how can I be born again? And Jesus says, you can't make it happen. It's a wind thing. You just kind of have to wait for it to blow through. And when it blows through, put up your sail and hope you catch it. I think what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus here is, you can't make it happen. Pharisees were into making things happen. They were going to make everybody so holy with all their rules, the Messiah would finally come. If they could just make all the people keep a perfect Sabbath, Messiah would come. They were into making things happen. And Jesus looks at him and says, you wouldn't get it till you're born again. Well, how can I be born again? This is something you can't make happen. You have to wait for it to happen to you. Now, this is frustrating to someone who's used to making things happen. What do you do when there's something you're told you must have you don't have it, you have to get it, and you can't go after it. What do I do? I think Nicodemus is highly frustrated at this point. Nicodemus answered and said to Jesus, how can these things be? And I don't think now he's asking an intellectual answer, an intellectual question. I think what he's saying is, okay, you say I don't have it. You say I have to have it. You say I can't make it happen. Then how can it happen to me? And we have Nicodemus in quite a frustration and a quandary, and I'm going to let Lee get him out of it. So when I was a teenager, my mother picked a girl for me, and the problem was that even though the girl was a family friend, there was no click. There was no spark, there was no magic, there was no fire, there was no romance. The girl's mother picked me for her daughter. Same problem, the girl didn't have any click with me and I didn't have any click with her, but we went on to college and our friends told us that we ought to be a couple. They said, you guys would be perfect for each other, but we didn't have a click, we didn't have a spark, we didn't have romance. And then one day in my dorm room, I made a list of the qualities I thought would be the most needful in a life companion and lo and behold, this girl had all of them all of them. And I thought, 100%, have mercy. How could I have been so blind? So I called her on the phone in her dorm room, and I said, you know how our parents and our friends have said we should be a couple? She said, yeah, isn't that crazy? And I thought, that's not quite where I'm going to go right now. 
She said, why do you ask? I said, well, I was just wondering if we were going to be a couple, what should we do about that? How would that ever come to be? She said, well, I suppose you'd have to ask me for a date. I said, there you go. Okay, then I'm asking you for a date. There's a program at our auditorium here this weekend on Saturday night. I'm asking you to go with me on it as a date. And she said, are you kidding? I said, no, I'm serious. And she said, okay. Enthusiasm just oozing out of the phone. And Anyway, we went to the program that night. And on the way back to the dorm, I was escorting her back to the dorm. I said, well, how did it go for you? She said, no click. Didn't work for me. How about you? I said, no click. Didn't work for me either. I said, what should we do? She said, well, I suppose we could try dating a few more times and see, you know, if anything happens. We tried a few more times, and we came to the conclusion the airplane was just going to taxi down the runway, but it was never going to take off. And so we, you know, gave up on it. No click, no spark, no magic, no romance, no fire. I transferred to another college. I met my wife, Margie. She wasn't my wife when I met her, but I met her. And as soon as I met her, there was not a click. There was not a spark. There was a nuclear reaction. It's just whoosh. And we got married. And we've been living for 44 years. And she told me she's not going to leave me. And I told her if she did, I'd follow her. So, you know, she's she, she stuck. Um, but there's a big difference between trying to make a relationship happen with no click and a relationship where there's a click. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you need the click. You can't have a meaningful heart-stirring relationship with me if you don't have the click of the new birth, the click of conversion. It's absolutely necessary. Uh, Gary referred to a quotation from Ellen White, the book Steps to Christ. I'm going to put it here on the screen for you right now. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love and the joy of communion with him that it will cling to him and love to Christ will be the spring of action. That's describing having the click. That's having the fire. That's having the romance. That's having the excitement. That's having the spirit. It's a heart experience. However, notice what it says next. A profession of Christ. So I'd be calling myself a Christian. Without the click, without this deep love, is mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. That's another way of saying, if I'm trying to walk through the motions of church and Christianity, but I don't have the new heart, I don't have the new birth, I don't have the click, then it's boring, boring, boring. And I watch the clock to see if the pastor's going to end on time because I'm done with him as soon as I can be. I'm just here. I, when I was little, I played house. Now I'm grown up. I play church. I go through the motions because I am clickless. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you are clickless, buddy. You are clickless. You need the click. You need the new birth. Conversion is not optional. And it's ironic that it is one of the, it is, it, it is one of the things that is talked about the very least in Christianity. And yet it's the starting place. It's the starting place. I mean, you can have seminars and workshops on your spiritual gifts. What good does that do for people who haven't been born yet? You can have conflict management seminars. What good does that do if people haven't been born yet? You can talk about witnessing and outreach. What good does that do if people haven't been born yet? Getting the click, getting the new birth is ground zero. It's where it starts. It's where it begins. It's where everything launches from. It's where the rubber meets the road. Nicodemus hadn't had that yet. And the church has far too many attending who haven't had it yet either. Clickless. Be astounding to know how many clickless people sit in churches weekend after weekend. Here he is. Gary's made it clear. This guy is like at the top of his game. He is the king of the mountain. He is the teacher in Israel. And he doesn't have a clue. He doesn't have the click. Well, I became very interested in the click. I thought, man... If we, can't, if we can't somehow wrap our minds around conversion and the new birth, and somehow, if God will allow us to somehow grasp enough to help ourselves and others experience the click, then that would be worth something. So I began studying feverishly, trying to understand more about how we might get experience the click, the new birth. So I was very fascinated when I was reading in the book Desire of Ages, there's a chapter entitled Nicodemus. And I thought, well, Jesus told him he needed the click, he needed the new birth. Maybe in this chapter, in the book in Desire of Ages, maybe I'll find something that will be helpful to me. And as I was going through, I came across a paragraph in that chapter. It said this. It said, at no other time and at no other occasion did Jesus make more clear 
the steps necessary for the click of conversion. That wasn't on the screen because I'm not, I didn't put it on the screen. I'm just telling you, I read that. At no other time and in no other place did Jesus make the steps for conversion more clear. I thought, okay then, thanks, thanks for the clue. I'm going to John 3. I'm going to find what is clear there because I want to know more about the new birth. I want to know about the click. So I start reading John 3 with a fine-tooth comb. I read through it. I said, I don't see anything clear in this. So I tried it again. Ah, it's not clear yet. And I'm thinking, boy, if, it, if it's not any clear, if no other time and no other occasion does he make it clear than he makes it here, I'm thinking, well, this is going to be a long, hard winter because I'm not seeing much clear here. I mean, think about it. Think about what went on, right? Um, Nicodemus says, can we talk about spiritual things? Jesus says, you wouldn't have a clue. What's clear about this? Is this clear? Are you clear now? Click a conversion, new birth. Is it falling into place? Are you grasping it? You're saying, okay, there it goes. That works for me. No. Can we discuss? Jesus says, no, we couldn't discuss. You wouldn't have a clue. You wouldn't get it. You have to be born again first. Not clear yet. Nicodemus is sure not seeing it very clearly. You know, Jesus didn't say you can't go to heaven. He says you can't even see the kingdom of heaven. You can't even see the things of God. You cannot even see spiritually. He says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And you aren't of the Spirit. The Spirit's not in you, so you aren't going to be able to see, no matter how much we talk about it. I've told this story before, but uh, when our kids were just uh, in elementary school, we took them to a place called the Pacific Science Center in Seattle. It was a place where you could learn about science, and it was user-friendly and kid-friendly, and you paid money to wander around in the place for hours and learn things, and it was fun. And I was walking ahead of my family, and I came across a display that looked like this. It looked kind of like a calendar with a bunch of numbers in the center of each square. Uh, there was blotches of color, and at the top right-hand corner of every square, there was a small number. Big number in the middle, small number on the, side, on the top corner. And I thought, well, I wonder what this is all about. So I looked at the little explanation that they had put beside this display, and they said, this display is to help you learn whether or not you are colorblind in any way, shape, or form. Then it went on to say, there is a large prominent number in the center of every square, in the center of every blotch of color, large prominent number. If you do not see a large prominent number in every square, there's something wrong with your eyes, come back over here and we'll tell you what's wrong. So I went back over and I looked at it very carefully. And I thought, you know, I'm a little troubled here because I did not see a prominent number in one square. One of the squares just had color, no big number. There was a little number, top right-hand corner. In fact, it was the one number seven, top right-hand corner of the grid. And you can't see it either because I didn't put it in. I was the one who made the graphics, so I didn't put it in there. You've been wondering, wow, my eyes aren't working very good either. No worries, that's just how it looked to me. I went back over and read it said there is a number 11 in the top right hand corner in square 7 and if you do not see the number 11 in square 7 it means you are colorblind to the color red when it is embedded in other colors they said you're colorblind you have a problem well I'm not going to talk more about all the things on ramifications that that brought into my mind just to say this I really am colorblind I don't see red when it's embedded in other colors I can see red when it stands alone you know for example, I can see the red flowers up here with the purple ones. Yeah, the red flowers are the purple ones. Can you guys see them? <laughs> I was just pulling your leg. It's white flowers are the purple ones. But I can't see red. If there had been red in there, I wouldn't have seen it. Now, I can't fix that. Unless there was some sort of surgery they could perform on me to fix that. Or unless some sort of miracle could take place, I'm never going to see red when it's embedded in other colors. It's not my fault. It's the way I was born. It's the way I'm hardwired. I can't do a thing about it. And you and I were hardwired not to see spiritual things. That's why Jesus said there's something wrong with your first birth. You have to have a second one. Got to have a second one. Doesn't matter how trained or how bright you are, Nicodemus, there's something wrong with your first birth and you're never going to get it. Never going to have the click. Never going to have a heart-stirring relationship with heaven if you don't first have the new birth. Got to be born a second time. All right, so Nicodemus is told, you have to be born again. How clear is that? He says, how can a man be born again if he's, you know, grown? How do you get back into your mother's womb? That's crazy. So his second question was, 
How can I get reborn? You remember what Jesus said. Gary pointed it out. You can't make it happen. It's a spirit thing. And then he tells about the wind, you know. Gary went through that for us. Went through that. You can't make it happen. It's supernatural. Wow, well, this is really clear, isn't it? At no other time, on no other occasion, does Jesus make it more clear the steps necessary for conversion. Are you getting it? Do you have it all figured out now? Nicodemus didn't get it. He's still unclear. It's a spirit thing. Well, thanks a lot. You told me I need it. And now you tell me I can't get it. Jesus says, well, you know, it's, it's like the wind. Wind blows through. You don't know where the wind's coming and you don't know where it's going. But when it moves that branch on that tree over there, you can tell it's doing something and it's like that. You don't know where the Spirit's coming from. You don't know where it's going. But when it stirs the leaves of the tree of your heart, oh boy, all of a sudden, you know something's different. It's a whole new ball game. All of a sudden, this very Bible that you used to think was boring, boring, boring is like a love letter from a fiancé. You read it completely differently than you'd read it as a, as, as a Bible commentary or as a dictionary. You read it as a love letter. Something happens when you have the click. Changes everything. Changes everything. But he still doesn't know how that's going to happen. So he comes back with a third question. You said it's a spirit thing. You said it's like the wind. You said I can't make it happen. All right, so is there anything I can do? Humanly speaking... Is there anything I can do that could make myself available to the spirit wind so that he can do what you said he has to do more quickly? Because quite frankly, between you and me, Jesus, I want the click. I'm tired of playing church. Between you and me, Jesus, I might be the first elder in my church, but you know what it is? It's mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. I go through the motions... I wouldn't want people to know the reality in my own barren soul, but I want something better than that. So is there anything I can do? You said it was like the wind. Can I jump into the wind? Well, is it real clear to you? No other place. More clear than here. How clear is it so far? Not very clear. And I'm reading, and I'm rereading, and I'm reading, and I'm rereading, and I'm going, so what's clear? What's clear? And then on this day, all of a sudden, one day, it jumped out of the page at me. What's clear? What happens next? Jesus says, you want to know if there's something you can do? There is. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now get this. Jesus is answering the question. Humanly speaking, is there anything we can do that could facilitate the click that the Holy Spirit has to be responsible for? Is there anything we can do to hurry that along? That's the question. And the answer is yes. There's one thing. And then Jesus tells him the snake story. We know the story. It's found in Numbers 21. That's where the children of Israel have been grumbling and complaining. God lets the, uh, the, the serpents that are already there begin to bite them. He'd been protecting them, but now he withdraws his protection. They're starting to die like flies. Moses goes to God and says, what can I do? God says, make a serpent of bronze, place it on a cross, lift it up above the camp, and tell anybody who has been bitten if they will look in the direction of the uplifted serpent on the cross, they will be healed. It's supernatural. It's miraculous. I thought, okay, Jesus is the one who was explaining to Nicodemus the one thing, humanly speaking, that we can do to get closer to the click. And he told the snake story. So I'm going to go to Numbers 21, and I'm going to read that with a fine-tooth comb. And guess what I discovered in Numbers 21? There is no condition for being healed except looking in the direction of the uplifted cross. That's the only condition. It doesn't say you have to believe it. It doesn't say it's not going to work if you don't have faith. 
Doesn't say that if you were messing with snakes when you got bit, you shouldn't have been playing with them. Don't you know about the law of the harvest? You reap what you sow. You're in for a long, hard run. Or you, you, know, you blew it. No, doesn't say that. Doesn't say, listen, if you got healed once and you started playing with snakes because you thought you were invincible and now you got bit again, it doesn't work a second time. There are no conditions in Numbers 21 for healing except look in the direction of the uplifted cross. Now, this isn't rocket science. The serpent on the cross, elevated above the camp, represents Jesus on the cross. So what is Jesus saying? Let's make this as plain as we can because it gets no clearer anywhere else. So what's Jesus saying? You want the click? Here's what you do. You open up the Gospels. You open up the Gospel of John with a prayer and you say, Lord Jesus, tell you the truth. I don't need to tell you this because you already know, but I'm clickless. For me, reading the Bible is mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. I'm just telling you the truth, Jesus. You already know it, but I'm telling you, I'd like that to change. So I'm going to do what you told Nicodemus to do. I'm looking your direction. I'm looking at the uplifted Savior. I'm looking at Calvary, and I'm asking you to bring that spirit wind, blow through my soul, and bring me into a higher experience than I have right now because this mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery is going to take me out of the church real quick if I don't find something better. The one thing you can do with a prayer, open God's Word, look at Jesus, even if it's boring, and you don't have to have faith, and it doesn't matter if you've messed with sin and Satan. And it doesn't matter if you don't believe. Jesus made no conditions, no, no conditions. He just said, look, life in a look at the Savior. So what's clear? This is clear. This is clear. There's life in a look at Jesus. Are you clickless? Jesus promises that he'll fix it. He doesn't say, give us a try and maybe it'll work for you. No, he says, do this and the spirit wind will blow. That's what he says. He promises. You know, in Malachi, he promises there'll be a blessing for returning tithes and offerings. He says, bring them in, watch what I'm going to do. He promises. He says, I'm writing my name on this check. This is good. You can take it to the bank. He's doing the same thing here with Nicodemus. You want the click? I promise you can get it. Here's what you do. You look in the direction of the uplifted Savior and you say, I want what you promised Nicodemus. And I'm going to read, even though it's boring me to tears right now, I'm going to read until the tears change from tears of boredom to tears of appreciation and gratitude. I'm going to do that. And he says, good on you because that's what's going to happen. My spirit's going to blow through. That's the promise. John 12, 32, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people. Not some, not those who have enough faith, not those who, who, who did it right, who got it together. No, I will, if I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And maybe it would just be worth adding at this point that he said, you want to draw people? He didn't say, give them convincing arguments and proof texts. He didn't say that. He said, lift me up. And if you will lift me up, I will take it from there. Because you know what? Convincing arguments do not convert people. They just fill churches with unconverted people. And that's a recipe for disaster. Do we want to fill our churches with unconverted people? I don't think so. So what is the remedy for that? It's lifting Jesus up, introducing people to Jesus, helping them learn how they can look his direction for themselves, and then letting the spirit wind blow through, convert their hearts, and then we've got something. Then we have something that's not going to walk away a few years later. How does it work? Personal conversion story. So I was a teenager. My dad's a preacher. My, my cousin's a preacher. My uncle's a preacher. My grandfather's a preacher. My great uncle's a preacher. Uh, that preacher's coming out in my ears. I had gone to Christian schools, parochial schools, all my life. And for me, I got A's in Bible class. But it was mere talk and dry formality and heavy drudgery. It was boring, boring, boring. And then one night, a Friday night, my girlfriend was out of town. 
And uh, I decided to go hang out with a guy friend. So I go to his house and knock on the door. He comes to the door. I said, my girlfriend's gone for the weekend. I don't know what to do with myself here. So I'm just coming over to hang out with you. What's going on? He said, well, I'm just getting ready to go to a Bible study. And I just about lost my teeth. A Bible study? You going to a Bible study? No way. He says, yeah, I am. And then he starts telling me the names of the people who were going to be at the Bible study. And they were all people that I knew would be the last people who'd be at a Bible study. Why would they? These are the party animals. I'm not talking about Republicans and Democrats. Party animals. These are people who were users and abusers. You know, they were dopers and dealers. And when he told me that's who's at the party, I said, no way. He says, yeah, no, it really is. Come, come check it out. Now, what had happened was some weeks earlier, that group of party animals had been at a Friday night party. They were not studying the Bible. They were in various states of ruin and disorder. You know what I mean? Altered consciousness. Uh, drugs, liquor, you name it. And at that party, one of them, under the influence, said, Hey, man, I was wondering, man, like, what if there's really a God, dude? And what if he, like, wants to connect with us? And what if we missed out on the whole gig because we were bored by church and so we didn't give him a chance? What do you think about that, man? And because they were in various states of ruin and disorder, there was a long pause. They weren't thinking very quickly. And then someone said, oh, wow, man. And someone else said, bummer, man. Someone else said, major bummer, dude. So the first guy says, so, so what should we do about it, man? And then somebody said, don't get me wrong. Don't think I'm a Jesus freak or anything like that. Don't goody, goody two shoes or religious, whatever. I'm just going to tell you, maybe we could try an experiment. They said, what kind of experiment, dude? He says, well, how about we get a hold of Bibles? And what if we like open up the Bibles to read about Jesus? Like we could go to the Gospel of John, right? It's supposed to be all about him. So we go there and we say, okay, God, if you're out there, we're not saying we believe you're out there. We're just saying, if you're out there and you want to connect with us, we're going to look at your son's life story here. So go for it. And if he connects with us, far out. And if he doesn't, then we can say later days to him and he can't do nothing to us because we gave him a chance. He didn't come through. It's his problem, not ours. And they all said, cool. <laughs> so on Monday, that one of the party animals went to the Bible teacher and said, do you know where we could get together on a Friday night? We want to try an experiment. We want to read the gospel of John and see if there's really a God out there who wants to connect with us. And the Bible teacher said, you can use my house. You can have the living room and the kitchen and the dining room and the, fellow, you know, fi the, the, the fireplace, the whole bit. My family and I will be in the back room and we'll be praying because that's a really cool experiment. And we think, I think, God's going to come through for you. So they did. They started going. Now, I want you to think about what Nicodemus asked and what Jesus answered. What's this group of party animals doing? They don't even, they, they're not even at the point of believing in God. They're not even sure there is a God. But they're looking in the direction of the Savior. And they're actually saying a prayer as best you could call it. They're saying, hey, if you're out there and you want to connect, go for it. We're giving you a chance. We're, we're, you got our attention. And what did Jesus say would happen when you did that? Click. That's what he said. And he is as good as his word. And that group of party animals became transformed friends of Jesus and they couldn't get enough of Jesus and they couldn't get enough of his word and all of a sudden man they're carrying around pocket new testaments and they're sharing with one another about the cool things that God is doing in their life and what Jesus is coming to mean to them and what they're discovering they mean to Jesus and there they are man they just can't they look forward to their Friday nights and they don't wait for Friday night because they're reading about him they're focusing on him day by day and guess what when Jesus comes in, he crowds stuff out. We don't get rid of stuff to come to him. We come to him and he crowds the stuff out. And they couldn't get enough of Jesus and he's transforming them. And then one night, on a Friday night, they're reading the story of the Syrophoenician woman. And she said, Lord, would you please, my daughter's demon possessed, would you heal her? And Jesus says, you know the story. You know, he says, well, you know, um, can't do it because, you know, you're not one of us. And she says, well, hey, I'll just take a crumb from the table. I may be a dog, but I'll take a crumb. You remember the story? And Jesus says, you know, great is your faith, woman. Your daughter's well. They read that. And then one of them said, I don't get this because the girl was demon-possessed. You don't get demon-possessed by accident. She must have been messing with the occult. 
And now God, her mom comes. She's not even asking for help. Her mom comes and Jesus fixes the girl. Now what's that all about? How does that work? And someone said, well, I think it's some intercessory prayer. Another person said, what's intercessory prayer? And the answer came back. Well, I think it's kind of like there's the good guys and there's the bad guys. And the good guys go to help somebody. And the bad guys come in and say, time out. You can't help them. They didn't ask for help. But the good guys say, yeah, but there's people over here who are praying for them. So get out of our face. We're here. We're going to fix this. I think that's maybe what intercessory prayer is, they said. And somebody else said, well, man, does it work? They said, well, it worked in that story. Yeah, but that was thousands of years ago. Does it work now? And they said, I don't know. Someone said, maybe we could try an experiment, dude. What kind of experiment are you talking about? Well, how about we pick the guy and the girl at our school who we think seem the least interested in spiritual things? And then let's pray that they get the click. Let's pray that they find out what a friend there is in Jesus and that he wants to be their friend. And let's just pray for that. They said, okay, good experiment. So who do we pray for? And I don't remember the name of the girl they chose to pray for, but the guy they chose to pray for was Lee Venden. They said, let's pray for him, man. If he gets the click, we'll know for sure it works because he's an unlikely candidate. So my friend says to me that night, I say, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to Bible study. Why don't you come with me? So I go, but I don't go because I'm interested in the Bible study. I go because I want to see a bunch of party animals with Bibles in their hand, like you go to the circus to see the freak show, you know, that kind of thing. I walk in the door with my friend and all of a sudden, all the people in that room who are praying for me, they go, oh, <laughs> intercessory prayer, man. <laughs> Look who's here. Keep praying. So there they are. They're praying for me. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. They're praying for me silently now. Like, Lord, you got him here. You got the fish to the boat. Now net him, you know. Pull them on in. Reel it all away. Bring them all the way home, Lord. So there they are. They're reading the life of Jesus. They're talking about what Jesus means to them, what they discover they, they mean to Jesus. And as I sit there, something happens to me totally unexpected. I start to cry. I didn't plan on crying. I didn't even know why I was crying. Truth is, the Holy Spirit was squeezing my heart and it was making my eyes leak. I didn't feel comfortable with it. I was embarrassed. I put my head down and tried to sniffle discreetly. Do you know how hard it is to sniffle discreetly? <laughs> so I'm sniffling. Finally, they say, we're going to have closing prayer. It's a little conversational prayer thing, and then we're going to leave. So I stayed on my chair. They knelt. I watched them. They bowed their heads. I kept my eyes open. They talked with Jesus like you talk with a friend. They didn't use a bunch of cliche phrases that you string together. You know, we've heard those kind of prayers, but it wasn't that kind. They're talking with Jesus as friend to friend, and as they pray, I just keep sniffling. And when they finish, they leave, except for two friends who see me over there sniffling with my head down. And they come over to me and they say, are you okay? And I said, I don't know what's going on, man. And they said, well, we know what's going on. You just got ambushed by Jesus. <laughs> and they told me they've been praying for me. And they told me something that I hadn't understood then, until then, but it has been my mantra ever since. And that's this. Christianity is not about what you do. It's about who you know. And who you know changes what you do. You don't work on behavior. You get to know the Savior. And the Savior changes your behavior. Oh, I was just on cloud nine. I went home that night after midnight. I got my Bible out, a Bible that I only use for required reading in classes. I, pl I, prop I just plopped it open. It, came, it fell open to Romans chapter 1. I read all the way through the book of Romans on, sitting on my bed after midnight. Couldn't put it down. And I'm thinking, when did they change Romans? Because it's all about friendship with Jesus. I, how'd that get in here? I didn't know that was in here. Had Romans changed? No. What changed? I'm seeing the number 11 in square 7. Click. Spirit wind blows. Click. Next morning, I get up. It's Saturday morning. My dad's a senior pastor, Los Sierra College Church. They do two services there. He's getting ready to go to first service. He comes down the hall. As he comes down the hall, my door's open to my bedroom. He looks in, he sees me. I'm sitting on my bed with my Bible open on my lap, and I'm reading the Gospel of John because that's what they'd been reading the night before. And my dad looks in. And he goes back down the hall and he tells my mom, Lee's reading his Bible and it looks like he likes it. <laughs> my mom comes down the hall 
She peeks in, oh my, and they are in the kitchen like just, you know, oh. And I come in with my Bible in my hand. I say, Dad, did you know? Christianity is not about what you do. It's about who you know and then who you know changes what you do. It's so cool. And my dad didn't say to me, son, where have you been all your life? Have you not come to church with your ears on? Because that's the one string on my violin. I write books about that, son. I talk about that every Sabbath. Some people ask me, when am I going to quit talking about relationship with Jesus? Because I talk about him so much. No, my dad didn't say that. What he said was, isn't that wonderful? And then I got in the car and I went to first service. And I sat on the second row. My dad got up and began preaching about the privilege of having a friendship with Jesus and how as we get to know him better, he changes us from the inside out. And I'm thinking to myself, have mercy. I did not know my dad was such a hot preacher. I mean, think about it. I just told him that and he turns it into a sermon, you know? Like, good night, talk about an improv speaker. This is improv par excellence, you know. Had my dad's sermon content changed? No, what changed? I changed, why? Click, we've got to have it. Without it, we're dead in the water. But Jesus said to Nicodemus, you can have it. And he made it so clear that you can't miss it. Look my way. Even if it's boring, say a prayer, keep looking, and I'll take you not only from there, I'll take you all the way home. I want the eyes of my heart to be open. anyone in the hearing of my voice tonight that hasn't experienced the second birth and tonight they're looking and saying, Jesus, I want to live. Jesus, would you do for them tonight what they can't do for themselves? Would you breathe life into them 
as only you can do. And that every breath they take from tonight forward will remind them that they belong to you, that you have breathed true, real, abundant life into them. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We pray these things in, for your sake and in your sweet, sweet name. And all God's kids say,